Never think we won't go the extra mile to bring you better buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ. With us this week, it's Eli. Hello. And coming out of retirement, it's Ryan. Hello. No, hi. <laughs> um, so, just a heads up to the audience, this is the re-record on this episode. <laughs> this is the, the RJ cut. <laughs> yeah, this is the extended edition, special guest appearance, uh, because for the second time in five goddamn years, I forgot to hit record. So, you could know. you imagine? Could you imagine if a movie just released the director's cut and not the original cut? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish they did that with that Rebel Moon movie. Oh. <laughs> Relevant. You mean marginally improve it? <laughs> yeah, marginally. <laughs> Our better buddies icebreaker this week: What songs would be played on a loop in hell? What songs would be played on a loop in hell? I'm trying to remember what I said on the first. I genuinely can't remember what I said on the first one. I'll go around. <laughs> oh, hang on. I got you, Eli, because I do remember. Um, it's DJ Khaled. Oh, it was. Yeah, DJ Khaled's All We Do Is Win. Oh, my God. That song would. That, that would be my personal hell. <laughs> yeah, I can already tell you this one. Uh, it's whatever Christmas album that the grocery store I worked at over Christmas for multiple years played because over the fans, you could only hear the oboe and the bass drum <laughs> and it was on the same five songs on loop. So Oof. you just hear the little and then fans, fans, and then boom, boom. And that's all you heard for <laughs> oh two <my> months. God. <laughs> God damn. I learned the oboist name. So if I ever get terminal, well, oh we'll no! Leave that up for a minute. Oh no! <laughs> so oh dear! I live that hell, and I can tell you that is what they play in hell. It's not the oboist's fault. <laughs> what did they ever do to you? I don't know, but Lars, I'm looking for you. <laughs> tell him it was me. Allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, it was Lars. Um, because my original response was the song "Baby" from Justin Bieber. That uh, that baby, baby, oh, I could not stand that for eternity. Oh, I'm s <laughs> slightly older than you, and that did get played on repeat. So yes, it is. I, <laughs> I was I, Ryan. I you may be slightly older, but I'm not that young. To that's fair. For, that's to fair. missed it. I grew through the heyday. That's fair. I I, I also I, there was this anecdote of um, last month I went to a wedding. And baby started playing um, when, you know, during the dancing part of the wedding and the bride just went full, full in, full send it. Just, just every lyric, just with the amount of gravitas, like just waiting all, all her life since middle school to belt this out at her wedding. And my God, she sent it. So I, I appreciate baby. That would drive me nuts, but I, I respect that. And to be fair, like the way you told it was that, it sent you don't like the song, but it sent you so hard you were like, I have to respect this and join on the dance floor. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I didn't know the lyrics, but I went out and I was dancing. I, I you have to respect the beebs when <laughs> when the Bieber heads are out. <laughs> when the She knew it was a captive audience. She knew it was a captive audience that couldn't leave. They were there for a reason. So <laughs> That's it's true. Been, it's been waiting so many years. <laughs> when the beebs come out at night to stalk. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Michael Jackson's Thriller, but it's all Bieber fans. Oh God! <laughs> I think the additional part of my song, like part of the hell, like it would be all I do is win, 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 and it would be filled with those guys in high school who thought they were tough shit because they were in like high school football team and benched two hundred pounds one time. You know oh what my I mean? God! <laughs> you just reminded me. So, a couple days ago, I walked past somebody leaving the building who looked like the absolute most stereotypical jacked asshole. Like, <laughs> muscular as all hell, biceps big as his head, t-shirt that was two sizes too small, and was wearing the sunglasses while still inside. 
And I was like, man, I know exactly what kind of person you are right now, and I hope to God you prove me wrong. <laughs> I, I remember uh, when we were going to college, there was a, a very similar kind of person in the business school, and I heard a guy Which say one? that when he... <laughs> <laughs> no, he said that you know the the like coiffed hair, the mm. athletic shorts and shirt and sunglasses and boat shoes, and I, yeah, he just said like when you go through the business building, you see the same person like five times. It's just copy paste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, and then I was walking across campus the other day, and I saw these couple of kids walking by, and they were obviously freshmen, like. They just had baby faces. It was like, oh, you think you're a, co- you think you're an adult, but they were wearing, where they were in stereotypical frat bro like polos and shit. And I was like, oh, you guys have no idea how college kids actually dress. <laughs> oh yeah, the students are back, so we see the sorority with every girl wearing the exact same thing. The dude bros wearing just slightly different hues of the same thing. Like yeah, yep. it's, <laughs> it's the it's the group thing. <laughs> the, 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 the need the need to fit in so they just copied the group i like sports teams jerseys of teams they don't even follow <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah the uh the other song that would be my my hell loop is uh 500 miles the like <laughs> i would walk 500 miles because i love the song but i also know it's a song that if it's played on a loop i'm going to hate it <laughs> you're just screaming da 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 and bloody like you're just losing <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> can somebody stab my eardrums with a pitchfork already please uh. well our next segment is better buddies recommend where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy who would like to start uh i it's been a while since I've been on the show. Has anyone suggested uh, Delicious in Dungeon yet? You might actually be the first. All right. It is an anime that is on Netflix, but is not traditional. It blends both the food anime and the Western fantasy anime and humor into one. Uh, they realize that going deep into a dungeon, they need supplies. And instead of dragging all that down, why don't they just try to live off the land in the ecosystem of this dungeon? The characters are great. The plot's fantastic. <gasps> dungeon the ecosystem? Humor's pretty cool. Yep, the, it, there's, the paladin, quote-unquote, is really into eating monsters because he's just obsessed with them. Uh, the dwarf has lived in the tunnels his whole life, so he knows what to do with, like, lichens, and he farms on the back of clay golems and stuff like that. Like, he, it is an amazing anime, both in the f- classic food sense and the overall plot. It feels like an actual D&D party because they all have their own little quirks, and they blend so well together. I need to watch this for research purposes. Yes, absolutely. Because and you, I was going to say, this you, is like our, the most RJ thing I think I've ever heard. You text me the minute you're done because we need to, like, talk. Oh, because my... <laughs> we literally have D&D tomorrow night, yeah. and my character <laughs> is Dr. Buzz Nudson, professor of biology specializing in mutant ecologies and the adventuring ecosystem. Yep, you'll like this. You'll like this. <laughs> oh, man. It, no, seriously, it's binge it. It's worth it. I, I've turned about three people onto this, and they have thanked me profusely. And that's not even just a joke. They have literally said, "Thank you so much for introducing me to this." Oh my god! <laughs> like, because well, I, 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 I wanted to, like watching the commercials for it. I, it, the style, it just looks so nice. Like mm-hmm. the animation and just character designs and stuff. The the woman the woman who uh, writes it is also just a just a doll. Like she's if you've learned about like just the writer of the the manga and everything the extended universe books. She's really, she made sure she got the anime finished the month before Baldur's Gate three came out. Cause she uh, knew she would lose all her time and miss all her deadlines. If she didn't wrap it up. Hell yeah. <laughs> that is who we're talking about. I'm like, this is how I know it was in good hands. And it's been <laughs> great the whole way through. That's awesome. See, and I've seen some like screenshots and little clips in it from it and stuff. I think I saw one like literally earlier today. That was like, they, I think it was like, they tackled a doppelganger. Yep. And the one guy is like, <laughs> You 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 believe I'm the right me like the real me right and then Paladin I think it was just makes a note of like spoken in English, yeah yeah curse me out in English. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I will I will send you the scene after this as to why. So the halfling yeah. 
that they're, they're cornered and uh, the magic sword that the paladin has uh, ran away from the monster. So the halfling says there's not enough wor curse words in the common tongue. So he just starts going through different language curse words. At him. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Hell yeah. Uh, Eli, do you want to go? Uh, oh yeah. Sh I, sorry. I took a second. I forgot what I recommended. <laughs> you forgot? Uh, no, I'm not, I feel like it's just like this. After crowd, I wronged uh, you so horribly the first time around. <laughs> so I, the, for the, probably the third time on this podcast, I'm going to recommend uh, not another D and D podcast. Uh, I am on campaign three. I'm sure the other two times I recommended campaigns one and two. So we're going to round it up to three. It's just so good. If you have any interest in like D and D actual play, uh, please give Nad Pod a listen. The characters are amazing. The hosts are so funny and so talented. Brian Murphy's my favorite DM. Um, it's just, it's just all like I'm. I've at this point now. Usually, I listen to podcasts when I'm like driving. That's kind of like exclusively when I listen to it. But now I've just been like sitting like on my couch just listening to it because I've just been so engrossed in the story and the world and the characters and yeah not another, not another D&D podcast is just phenomenal I'm so glad you listen to this now because it's so nice having somebody else who knows what I'm talking about <laughs> I like their D&D &D court that one's that those are oh D&D &D court is so fun I, I was joking I was like D and D Court is my second favorite podcast now. <laughs> it really is though. Like, if I could, I keep saying like I want to just reach out to them and be like, "Look, I'm sure there's cases you guys don't handle. If you just want to pop those my way, I'll start a fully second <laughs> podcast to cover the overflow. It's okay." I I I don't know if I told you, but I always wanted to do an in character like use yeah. the um rotoscope animation and make myself my old dwarf character because he was always the moral center of the party and give advice in character to people uh by doing animation <laughs> rotoscope oh that'd be awesome yeah <laughs> i think that'd be a great choice yeah a i gotta I, I, I practice a little bit with it but i gotta get the animation down a little bit quicker it's it's difficult but not too bad um but yeah nad pot i love the i mean it's it's on the one hand, it's very, very good. And on the other hand, like, because it's good, it's almost kind of, in, at least in my opinion, become the standard I measure D&D &D podcast to now. Oh, yeah. Um, like, especially if they're focusing more on being a D&D &D podcast versus just being a comedy podcast. Yeah. Because, um, like, if any of y'all have listened to The Real Housewives of D&D, &D, <laughs> that's a fun <laughs> show. I don't know that I love how they structure their uh, series markers because it's so wildly <laughs> different from any other D&D podcast. Because, like, um, with Real Housewives of D&D, their first season is, like, ten episodes. And they're like, yep, that's season one. And you're like, wait, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> that's season one. Been, how long have we been running our Starfinder campaign? Five years now? <laughs> yeah. And it's... They, it's still all the same campaign. They're just like, yep, that's season one of the campaign. Now we're on season two of the campaign. And it's like, okay, okay. I guess that's How many episodes was it for this podcast to get to season two? Oh, we're not at season two yet. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, hang on, I can tell you. We have a, until episode 276, I believe. Okay. Any specific reason for that number? Uh, yes, and it will be revealed in time if you can't figure it out. <laughs> you you okay. can figure it out. It's possible. Somebody will. But I don't think somebody's going to do it in time. So uh, hit us back up at the end of February. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, NADPOD, I fucking love it. And I think one of the things I love about it, and Eli can vote, like, mirror me on this. Um, they're all just very dedicated to enjoying what they do and learning and growing from it. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the coolest parts of it is Jake Hurwitz. The guy had never played D&D &D before picking up season one and has become probably one of the better role players I've seen in terms of his dedication to I'm going to craft characters because he's he has only played fighters. <laughs> like he played a rogue and for like a hot minute played a monk for like a couple sessions and a rogue for a couple sessions and then like 
one mini campaign as a ranger. Like, he's dabbled with other things, but in the main three campaigns, he keeps playing fighters, but they keep being distinct characters as he's, okay. like, focusing in on the subclass aspect of it to inform what the character will be like. And it's just a great example of, like, this is the like he, this is character work. Yeah, and it's so fun, like, you know, when, when Murph... Uh... Uh, signals the end of the episode and you hear the players just go aww <laughs> like genuine just <laughs> disappointment they wanted to keep playing and like find out more about the story I, I think that's the i think that's the big thing why i keep coming back to nad pod is everybody on that all four murph caldwell emily and, and jake just seem to be having the time of their lives so well, and murph and em- emily are just a good duo too in, oh. in general oh my god they're wonderful they're they're wonderful on nad pod and dimension 20 um just just it's so funny because murph is such a rules like kind of a rules junkie and emily's just pure card like chaos (laughs) incarnate that's that's something a lot of people don't realize is emily is also a rules junkie she just likes finding the flex points on the rules yeah she knows how to bend them (laughs) anybody who and that's somebody who used it as a critique against her i was like but i don't think it's really a critique it's just that like if you don't know dungeons and dragons she seems to be coming out with the wildest wacky shit but if you know Dungeons and Dragons, you're like, ah, yes, you're you're doing the thing that everybody should be doing. Good work. <laughs> no, I, I mean they're they're also playing D and D the right way, not just following the rules and like you know bending them and everything, but just having fun and just mm-hmm. really role playing and stuff. So, yeah, I I I cannot recommend uh, not another D and D podcast enough. It is one of the big, not just like podcasts that have consumed my life, but just pieces of media. Well, and I think it's something on any creative project, right? The people doing the project should enjoy it. Um, Because it's one of the things that always made me a little nervous was like, oh, Dungeons and Daddies, like, uh, Beth hates games. Like, hates board games. (laughs) So it's kind of like, okay, you're doing the thing, but I'm always a little cautious. Like, okay, are you going to keep dedicating yourself to this? Um, Whereas, like you said with NADPAT, like, they fucking love doing it, so... Cool. Uh, my recommendation, because it was just a fascinating video essay, the most disastrous production in animation history, parentheses, Thief and the Cobbler by Saber Spark. Um, huh. It was something that popped up on my, like, recommended for you YouTube page. And I was like, okay, this is a wacky thumbnail because it looks like uh, Jafar, but he's got blue skin and... The, it says the twenty four million budget made six hundred thousand. What what the hell's going on here? What what the fuck does that mean? Um, and it's like this hour long uh, video essay on the movie The Thief and the Cobbler uh, by oh, fuck who's the guy? Um, the same animation studio that did Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Mm. Okay. Um, the guy who like headed that animation studio won tons of awards for like their commercial work and had a really distinctive like touches and was really dedicated to the craft but his dream project was this movie the thief and the cobbler it was based on arabian and middle eastern uh folk tale and it took like 20 years to get made oh my god <laughs> because he kept losing funding on it and was, like, trying to self-fund it. So, like, they had, like, at minimum two full turnovers of animators. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, and part of the, like, originally it was supposed to be based off these um, Middle Eastern children's books. And then that fell through. So they, but they got to keep, like, for the test animation they had, they got to keep one thing. It was the animation of the thief and the design of the thief they're like okay well we got this thing let's keep going they had like three opportunities for funding come show up and then fall through because the guy was a major perfectionist but also wasn't he didn't storyboard out the movie so there would be parts of the movie where like if he particularly liked a shot or a scene or a beat he poured a ton of time and effort into it but then, like, didn't care about transitions. 
Like that's the so boring basically part. watching someone's manic kind of obsession just kind of break down around them. Yeah. <laughs> I have bookmarked this already. It is on my watch list. <laughs> Cause it also, the, the essay also goes into like the history of the animation studio and how, because it's tied so closely into the history of this movie and how like, Oh, because they were winning awards and doing such good stuff with commercial animation. Um, like Steven Spielberg ended up approaching his studio because of how particularly dedicated he was in order to get who framed Roger Ma rabbit made of like, you were the guys who are going to be so meticulous on making sure the animation syncs up with the live action and acts appropriately. And it worked because it's goddamn who framed Roger rabbit. It made history, but part of agreeing to do it was, he looked at them and was like, okay, but afterwards you help me make my movie. Like, you'll fund my my passion project. And Disney and Warner Brothers are both kind of like, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And afterwards, Disney said, but what if we didn't? Goodbye. <laughs> um, Steven Spielberg also made some similar promises. Like, yeah, we'll help out, we'll help out. And then, like, saw the passion project and the state it was in. was like, yeah, what if we didn't? <laughs> oh, my um, God. Warner Brothers finally, like, agreed to do it, but basically was like, yeah, we agree to do this, but we're having a third party, like, basically contract thugs in on this, is the way it seemed to me, of, like, these guys are here to make sure you meet deadline. If you do not meet the deadline, we take everything. And, of course, they didn't meet the deadline, and Warner Brothers took it, slapped it together, got some, like, third party animator zane to like patch it together as best they could and the guy who ended up doing it was like yeah i'm probably gonna get a lot of hate for like doing this and finishing this project but i thought it was more important that it sees the light of day to preserve the animation history here than it just gets scrapped entirely um went through like seven name changes and was to nobody's surprise a complete disaster um, it was intended to be more of, like, an adult animation and originally was going to be completely silent. Like, no voice acting, all physical comedy. And they got some beautiful animation, but just a, just a nightmare of a movie that, plot-wise, was garbage. <laughs> yeah, some of, the, some of the wildest stories I've ever heard are just bad movie productions. <laughs> just <laughs> insane. For real, though. But yeah, this uh, this video essay on the Thief and the Cobbler, it's it was a good hour. Like a good... Could you even watch? Can you even watch Thief and the Cobbler? Is that available anywhere? Oh, probably not. No, Again, okay. made like no money. Sure, so they wouldn't sure. put it on any streaming service. Yeah, interesting. So it's almost like a lost media kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you got to buy it either on YouTube, Apple TV, or Amazon Prime. It's not for free anywhere. Oh, gotcha. Oh, at least you can watch it. Maybe on Roku. Hold on. <laughs> oh, Roku? Roku. Uh, <laughs> Roku is not coming through. No, they're just linking us everywhere else that I just listed. Um, I, don't know what hoop, I don't know what Hoopla is, but apparently it's on there. Hoopla. Oh, there you go. Hoopla. <laughs> Hoopla. And, like, they obviously show some clips of the movie in the video essay, and it really does have some really cool animation stuff going on. And, like, one of the cool things they said was, like, oh, most are animated on the 12s and 2s, and this was on the 24s. So like, but that was also a problem because there was more frames they were animating because it was a frame a second. So, yeah, just a fascinating bit of animation history I'd never heard about. All right, our next segment is how to be a better buddy, where we give some real and some humorous advice. Our first question this week, are you willing to admit when you're wrong? Why or why not? With the further details... Are you willing to admit when you're wrong? Why or why not? If it depends on the circumstances, what makes it more likely for you to admit you're wrong versus what conditions make it less likely? Now, now, Ryan, we on the on the lost recording of this, we we went in, we went in on the on these questions, and now we have to bring up those emotional. <laughs> I, and I as, mean, mine's pretty. Oh, go ahead. As I established on that last one, and I feel I should establish it again. I'm never wrong. Never wrong. <laughs> so I don't know what this small feeling is like for you mere mortals, but I'm sure I can guess. As someone who both professionally and, in, and privately like prides himself on being a problem solver, 
I always admit when I'm wrong because otherwise it devalues any advice I give. If I stick by my guns, even when it comes out that I'm wrong, I mean, I'll argue, I'll make an argument for myself whenever I feel like I need to, but usually if I look it up later, I'm wrong. I'll be like, oh, my bad. Um, Because I I feel if you're known for sticking to being wrong too often and too publicly, you lose credibility in the eyes of your your friends and and loved ones. Yeah. What a prep. That was a very pragmatic uh, way of approaching it. I, I didn't think of it like that. <laughs> Eli and I out here getting all like mushy gushy of like, oh yeah, you know, it's just it's it's better if you if you just humble yourself and admit when you're wrong. Like it's so much better for you, and like you'll feel better, and you know you should you should be able to apologize and for yourself, even if they don't like it's. We want to apologize to make other people feel better, but we also need to be able to just apologize for ourselves and forgive ourselves. And <laughs> Brian's out here like, if you don't admit you're wrong, no one will believe you. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. I mean, yeah, RJ and I got pretty hippy dippy about it. <laughs> when you say it like that, <laughs> <laughs> see, you gotta feel your feelings, man. I, I got a friend of a friend who. I don't want to, he's not at level of conspiracy theory, but he's still kind of like, he starts with the right idea. He gets about 80% of the way of the right idea. And the last 20%, you just want to steer him into the right one. But he will not admit it, even when you show him facts and figures and he doubles down. And it's when you have someone like that, when they're wrong, clearly, factually, empirically, and they will not like take a second to reassess themselves. I don't want to interact with him. The only re- reason I do is because the other friend brings him around yeah. and he's <laughs> grandfathered in. So like, it, that's how I feel. It, and I know people in relationships, I've, I've definitely dated people who you could prove like, look, <laughs> you're wrong here. I have eyewitnesses. I have video camera recordings. Like there's, it's raw. <laughs> look, gravity works. I drop the thing. It hits the ground. Yeah, exactly. And they, they will not budge be, uh, or they'll pivot and try to change the subject or just never address the thing. If you're also dancing around the thing to not admit one way or another, like why why do people want to interact with you? It just kind of makes you a jerk, not a not anything else. Yeah, well, that's one of the things, especially in the last like, I've always I've grown to be better at admitting when I'm wrong, but I think the last like three to five years I've had to do a lot more of it and really focused in on like learning my own emotional responses to being told I'm wrong, so that. Especially when, like, logically I know, like, yes, I was wrong or that was wrong of me to do. Um, I can check my defensive response to be mm-hmm. like, oh, yep. Because uh, I've even had, like, I think I had a supervisor one time be like, hey, are you, are you okay? I was like, yep, I'm just kind of trying to speed run processing my emotions because I know you're right and my emotions want me to be defensive. Honestly, um, admitting that is honest and incredibly good like yeah at least lets them know where you're coming from because like it comes about like i i know i'm wrong i there's no other especially especially when there's no other option right um in the last year i had a situation where i was just wrong unequivocally no room for question was just fucking wrong and fucking wrong to the point where it was like I fucked up and I just had to eat crow. Like I talked, I talked to my boss and I talked to my boss's boss and was like, yep. Uh, I screwed up. Should have, I should have done differently. Should have done better. And was straight up told like, yeah, you should have, but because you care enough to acknowledge that you were wrong and that you're just seeking to do better. You're not defending yourself. We would have be ha- we were having the conversation we are, and not a very different one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's tough to let go of your pride, but I mean, it would be so much better in the long run. So now, now, if you want the hard one, it's looking at your own beliefs as time goes on and reassessing them, and make sure you're not wrong. <laughs> if if you have any worldviews or anything like that, like, am am I on the right path? And going through and actually sitting down and looking deeper and more factually at them, like, because a lot of times. Well, well, especially with how social media and stuff has programmed us to be knee-jerk, no matter what we might think. We're all very reactionary to what we read because algorithms are feeding us that stuff. Reassess yourself. Like, yep. take a minute and be like, all right, I've been feeling this way for 10 years. Am I? Yeah, okay. It, it still makes sense. 
mathematically, logically, socially, stuff, so on and so forth. Well, and to your point on that, like, I never want to be the smartest person in a room. Not exactly. I hate being the smartest person in a room. Um, for that very reason of the more I'm the not the like I don't want to necessarily be the dumbest person in a room. If I can find that <laughs> middle ground, I'm okay with that. Um, but never the smartest because if I'm never the smartest person in a room, it means I'm constantly going to have something I think I know challenged. Yep. Uh, and if I'm the smartest person in a room, it. Ryan, I got a sneaky suspicion you may also have been one of these kids, but uh, I was a, well, actually kid from, like, grade school through to, like, early high school. <laughs> I, I I was a bit, yeah, I was a little more reserved, but I also grew up around, like, scientists, so I had mm. to learn how to, like, make sure I know what I was talking about and learn how to state it. Because, because if you kid. didn't, you'd get well actually <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. It is exactly it. Yeah, no, my dad, one hundred percent, is that guy. He still is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and being one of those people, like I know if I am like in a room where I'm, pr there's a chance I'm the smartest person. It's easier for me to like start backsliding into that of mm -hmm. like, well, I'm clearly the smartest person in the room. So why are why is anybody asking like questioning me on this? How dare you? <laughs> hey yeah it's tough to be humble but it's a good skill to learn and on the flip side of being willing to admit when you're wrong if you're if you have been open to learning open to hearing what other people have to say open to learning new things and you know factually not opinionated but like a law of the universe or a thing or most informed decision you have that you're right be right. Don't be an asshole, but be right. <laughs> be a considerate asshole. Yeah. You don't have to you don't have to make people feel bad about being wrong, but don't bend over on what you know is factually true just because they don't like they're being shitty about being wrong. See, so, you know, for the second part of this question that what makes it more likely for you to admit you're wrong? What makes it harder for you to admit you're wrong? Mm. Like, it's I know with myself, like, things that are either opinionated or, like, don't really matter, I tend to be, like, I tend to play it off as a joke of, like, oh, yeah, I'm wrong, but I'm right, so. Or, like, if somebody, like, if uh, somebody says, like, their favorite color and it's not my favorite color, I'll just tell them, wow, you're wrong. Oh, you do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> now you say it out loud. Yeah, you do do that. But I always took it as like just playful. Just... Yeah, it, it is playful. Like it's it's definitely not me trying to like put anybody down. But it's the, I play that as playful because if I'm playing it as playful and we're all joking about it, I don't have to worry about like actually getting defensive over my opinion, you know? <laughs> sure. Because if I'm joking... It, I acknowledge that that's their opinion and that they're allowed to have that opinion that I don't have that opinion and that we're going to not have that opinion like be on the same page about it so we just have it out in the open that we're not going to agree on that I can tell you mine is if you provide me instructions and I follow those instructions and then you continue to have critiques afterwards I will say no you're wrong because <laughs> I did what you told me to <laughs> It's your fault for not providing adequate instructions, but this can't be what you not wanted when I have everything written down and I followed them exactly. <laughs> and and asked you follow-up questions while I was doing it. Oh my god, I just got annoyed from that example just now, like, vicariously. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> I'm guessing we can all think of a teacher that was that way. <laughs> or, a, or a boss, yeah. or a client, or a customer, or... I mean, oh yeah i worked i worked at a meat counter and someone says hey i wanted three pound rack of lamb for easter cool i go pull it out it's 3.2 and she got mad and i said oh. this is what you have to do <laughs> you're wrong <laughs> you want me to take I that point two it... off <laughs> i'll open it right here yeah yeah it's yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it's important to admit when you're wrong, but also just like don't be don't be a pushover when you you're like. Like an example like that, like he, Ryan was completely in the right. <laughs> so, I guess it, you gotta know when to dig your heels and for the important. Don't don't get caught up in unimportant shit. Like exactly. if somebody if somebody's arguing with you about Star Wars lore, did the who gives a shit? But <laughs> um, check yourself, Eli. There is oh nothing God. more important than Star Wars lore. <laughs> oh, nothing. <God. laughs> Fuck the war just... in Ukraine. Star Wars lore is more important. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> oh man, the second recording, we we're starting to lose it, RJ. <laughs> We've been podcasting for too long. Look, I understand it's an election year, but if my candidates can't get their Star Wars lore right, that's gonna tell me how I vote. <laughs> uh, our next question. What international food do you love because someone introduced it to you? With the further details... Curious to hear about international foods that you've come to love because someone introduced them to you. Whether it was a friend, family member, or a travel experience, I'd love to know what dish it was and how you discovered it. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, my brother is a big traveler. He That's his biggest hobby. He goes all around the world, and his favorite dishes are rice dishes, and his favorite rice dish is paella from Spain. Um, when, we, when we went to Spain years ago, we actually had squid ink paella, um, which was so just filled with so much umami and just seafood yeah. like goodness. Mm. Uh, paella is is amazing. Your, your teeth are jet black for the rest of the night, but oh yeah, no no, it's so <laughs> gross looking, but it's so worth it. <laughs> I come up from a very multicultural family, so I I was always introduced to things. My dad just saw thought, hey, you know what I want today? Ethiopian, and he would just find a recipe and make it at home. So I was always oh, like all over the place with food, but uh, I mean. Hot pot. It's just so simple. I, I went there because the only thing open on Christmas Eve, and a friend took me there. And now, I mean, <laughs> I, I had it. I had it for dinner tonight because I learned how to make it from at home. Like, Ooh. I'm obsessed with it. I want hot pot so bad. I've watched so many YouTube videos of people doing hot pot. <laughs> Ma- Madison has eight amazing places, and then I make it at home too. So, Ooh. Oh. um, so my. The one leads to the other. So in 2018, I think it was, um, it's Christmas Eve dinner. And for whatever reason, my mom had decided to get frozen sushi that she like thawed as part of our Christmas Eve dinner because we were just doing like a bunch of snacky things. It was after church and it was obviously not like good sushi, but the reason she got it was because, like, of like a full year or more earlier, my sister had gotten into sushi because of my aunt. So after church, my mom starts breaking this out, and my grandpa goes, well, who likes sushi in this family? Who in this family likes sushi? And, like, everybody else in the family raised their hands. Like, I think it was <laughs> me and him were the last ones that didn't. I was like, well, I'll try it. Like, Sure. I'll try a piece. And it wasn't bad. It was it was actually all right. <laughs> um, that led me to trying the local sushi place, which is again tried more varieties and got more into it. And then a couple years ago, went to Japan for the summer. A couple summers ago, went to Japan, had sushi there. Ended up having like whale and sea urchin and like a corn sushi. It was all really good, but. So that was how I got into, I came to love sushi because of that, but going on that trip to Japan and because I got into that, or one of the reasons I was like, yeah, I'll go to Japan was liking sushi. And then while in Japan discovered Indian food, we were just (laughs) wandering around. I was like middle of the day. It's the middle of a week. So like everybody's at work and shit and we're walking down this back alley and there's this, or like this shopping alley and there's this Indian restaurant. And we're like, yeah, let's go to let's go here for lunch. I've never had it. We'll try it. Sure. And it was delicious. They were making the non fresh right there next to you. Like Oh my god. Ooh. And like I finished my first one and I was halfway through the meal and the guy's like, Hey, you want more like another? Another? A non non? I was like, Yeah, yeah. Give me another one. He gives me one like <laughs> fresh hot out of the oven. Ooh. It was so a, good. I went back for board. dinner. 
Honestly, this suggestion is more important than the admitting you're wrong. Go try different foods. Yes. <laughs> Be, become cultural cultural with your tongue. <laughs> like, especially a- somebody who was raised in a meat and potatoes, pale food polka, like, <laughs> town and relative environment. Like, I, I gave credit to my parents, right? Like, credit to my mom. She did expand outwards. There was some stuff she made that was not, like, just, here's your steamed vegetable, here's your meat here's your potato or your carb. Like we try, like she would try and make like Asian dishes and Mexican food and other stuff. But Ooh, it, it, it primed me to get over my picky eating. I, I, if you haven't tried like Moroccan or there's a place here in Madison called Les Delices de Awa, which is a Western African place, which Ooh. is one of my favorites. Their chicken dishes are phenomenal. Uh, yeah, like it, it's my, my, my girlfriend was very much rural Wisconsin, you know, like I think they had a pizza place and a Chinese <laughs> place in the town they grew up in. But now, <laughs> she, now I've introduced her to Middle Eastern food and she made kefta like uh, Moroccan meatballs just out of the blue. And we did, um, baiti, which are, uh, uh, like a, like a ground beef Turkish, um, kebab that's wrapped in phyllo dough. So it's a little Ooh. bit crispy on the outside. Oh yeah, Stop. We, I'm we, getting so hungry. <laughs> we, whenever we see something just pop up on TikTok or on Facebook, we grab the recipe, we save it to a folder, we put it in a bag, and every weekend we draw one recipe out of the bag nice. and we make it. That's awesome. Yep. <laughs> What's really funny, so I grew up also in a small town, which is a Chinese and Mexican restaurant, and my brother, he was living in Milwaukee. Anytime he came back home, he would be, we'd be like, oh, what do you want to do for dinner? He'd always joke, be like, oh, I'll have some Indian food, uh, <laughs> Ethiopian food. <laughs> my mom was no. like, yeah, that's not. <laughs> and, and to anyone who hasn't tried Ethiopian, the Enjira bread they have is so good. It's like a, a delicious sponge. It's I know, so I want to try that. Ooh. Ah. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on travel vlog, uh, <laughs> food YouTube, and yeah. <laughs> Just so many foods. I mean, luckily Madison, uh, for not being just a, a big city, has lots of different cultural uh, yeah. options, which is really cool. Wherever my dad goes, if there's an Ethiopian place, he gets the kuftu, which is uh, spices and raw beef mixed together. And they Ooh. spread it thin on the um, injera and, and have like rice and other things on the side. It's his favorite. I, I, I have a thing about raw meat after working in a meat department for so many years, but... Like... I, I'm not joking. I'm so hungry. Like I was not hungry before, and now I'm just starving. <laughs> well, and one of the things that is in the lost episode that I want to bring back is that, like, I think some of the best restaurants I've gone to have been culturally authentic in the wrong city. So, like, yeah. going to the Indian place <laughs> in the middle of Tokyo, where it was, <laughs> they were Indian, like, no question, and it was so good or um like i was watching a youtube video the other week and they went into an area in like i don't know some californian city i don't know if it was san francisco or um one of the other big ones uh los angeles maybe um but they went into like the chinatown kind of area where it's like oh all the stores the english is second on the sign (laughs) <laughs> like, that's how you know you're probably going to get something good. Cool. Our next question. Moving cities for school in dire need of advice. Hey all, I, male 16, will be moving cities for a high school class in about a month. I'm keen on following my career and ambitions, but I fear this change. I'll lose friends, routine, and the worst of all, I've been to this city that my high school is in only a couple of times. I hardly know anything about it. I fear that it will be tough to fit in since I'm rather a socially awkward and introverted person. I'm afraid of moving, bros. Any advice on how to alleviate the stress slash how to keep my thoughts off of this will be appreciated, but I'm mainly posting this to try and see if anyone had similar experiences and or how they overcame them. Any advice will be appreciated. Take care, bros. Calling all bros. Bro alert. Bro alert. (laughs) Calling Sky bro. a lot growing up all right i was born in pennsylvania i lived in connecticut massachusetts maine wisconsin arizona back to wisconsin and i stopped moving every two to four years because my dad <laughs> was a scientist so when the grants drew up or the project ended we moved um so my advice is literally find anything in common and don't force it 
like if someone's talking, if you're into Pokemon and you hear someone talking about the newest game, just uh, kind of listen in respectfully and then chime in when it feels good. If you insert yourself too much, people are going to get defensive. But if you can slowly and become known as, oh, he's interested in the same thing I am, you'll make friends very easily. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that kind of echoes with RJ and I. Uh, that was the uh, in the lost recording. We mentioned that a lot. Just getting involved with things. Don't be passive. Be active and trying to be part of your new community. Because, um, yeah, it's not as not as much as like Ryan said, traveling to different states. Uh, I, 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 the first college I went to was three hours away from my hometown, and I didn't like it, so I went to a, a school that was thirty minutes from my hometown. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I am not, I'm not as keen as the, uh, traveling to a new place. But even though college was still a uh, new experience, and yeah, uh, I, I got out of my shell and just joined some clubs and met some great friends, and that was how I became part of the community. Like I think that's the big thing is you you are going into a new community. It doesn't make sense to avoid joining said community. Um, and I, I, in, the, in the post, the person is, is says they're shy, they're they're awkward and introverted, which I totally understand. But you might be. Uh, I use I've been using the term closeted extrovert to describe myself because I've been realizing oh I actually like hanging out with people. <laughs> So I, if you if you go out and on a limb and just uh, start talking to people, uh, making some friends, finding some hobbies, you might realize, oh, actually, I I'm not as introverted as I thought. So yeah, I think the I think the key thing is just be active and getting to know people and getting new to know your new environment. Don't be passive. Be be active. And don't overdo the enthusiasm because if you feel like you're trying too hard, people will be put off. Because that first impression is important, but you don't have to overthink it. Just feel comfortable in the conversation. If someone's like, yeah, you know, I got the new Pokemon game. You're like, Pokemon? Yeah, I like Pokemon. If you do that, people are going to be like, <laughs> uh, uh, be like, oh, hey, what was your what was your favorite one previously? And like, like something like that. Just a casual question, nothing too high pressure, nothing putting people on their back feet, and you will get a much better response. I mean, RJ, how did, how did we become friends? Like, just... Fuck if I know. In, in the lunchroom, and then I started throwing the the bowling days and stuff like that, and all that stuff. Like, I never went to the bowling stuff. You didn't? I thought you did. No, I oh. didn't live in. I didn't live in town. That's right. That's right. What do we? What do we hang out with then? It's been like five years. So, so I can actually <laughs> tell you. I can tell you, uh, yeah. because I didn't follow your advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> we enough people at work played Dungeons and Dragons that yeah. at lunch we would sit and talk Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games and stuff and led That's to right. other nerdy That's right. topics. And then when you were starting up the Starfinder thing, I did the, like, put my fingers together. I was like, you know, if you're doing Starfinder, I would be interested in that. If you have an extra chair, maybe, please. And I made room. Oh, and you I made, made room. room. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been the most dedicated since. You have, you right, have. Right, Ryan, you sounded so presidential when you said that. And I made room. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, you don't understand, Ryan. How many people do we start with? Uh, we started with six. Th technically Players. seven. One, one, yeah, and then we're down to four now. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. I mean, after five years, it's, yeah. I mean, four is impressive still. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm the opposite of of the uh, the question asker. I am not socially awkward, and I am not introverted. So I make things happen. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, I listen to people like, we should hang out sometime. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Oh, I'm so busy. I'm so tired. I'm like, what do you like to do? And they're like, I don't know. Do you like bowling? I like bowling. Do you like bowling? I like bowling. Let's go bowling. <laughs> you make the plan. We, we, we had a work party at a bowling alley because apparently me setting this up has become a company thing now because <laughs> now the holiday parties are always bowling parties. Um, <laughs> and we had people in from Europe and they were looking around awkward and I brought them all over. I integrated them with American people. I had them setting up on games before the CEO even showed up. And then <laughs> like, I don't, I don't like people say I, I'm so much of an aggressive host. It's, I think it's the Sicilian in me that if you have guests, they shouldn't have to do anything. And if you're a guest, the host shouldn't have to do anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, if you, if you're a host, you're the host. And if you're a guest, you're also the host. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so, like, yeah. When it comes, well, I, I, I adopt introverts. That's that's what I do. Just, I guess, fall into the gravity well of an extrovert. That's all. Well, well, it really so does funny. work though. Like, because like, yeah, my it, college I, experience I, was similar to the introverted thing, right? I came in, I knew two people. 
and by the end of first semester, I did not like either of the two people. <laughs> um, one of them ended up becoming being an ex girlfriend by that December. So I get to second semester of college, and I fucking hated it. Uh, but I was in this writing class that was one night a week, and one of the guys in the class, he was like, "Yeah, I needed to take something creative to like fill up my credits." But he worked in the building I was in, and in the building I lived in, the first floor had this like coffee shop, volunteer run. He was like, hey, if you need something to do, come volunteer. Like, I, I do some of the, sh- I run some of the shifts here. Come volunteer. So I volunteered that semester, and it got me through that semester, where I was like, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm not, I'm like, I'm okay. I like, I like being here again. And then my second year of college, Calvin shows up. He did the same thing Eli did, went away for college, and then that was too far, too much, came home-ish. And we looked at each other, and we're like, okay. We want to get involved. We don't want to just sit in our rooms. Let's be involved. There's a board game club. Let's go to that. So we went to the board game club. And we showed up. And we're like, hi. We'd like to play board games, please. And uh, my now friend Alex is like, yeah, we play board games. Come play some board games. We played like uh, House in the Hill and some of the other shit they had. And like Catan and uh, Werewolf and all that stuff. And like. Because of that, learned that there was an English club that I so I started going to that, and there was enough crossover in the English club and board game club people that it became like a friend group. Um, and then now like my job, I work one of the primary things in my job is like trying to encourage p- students to get involved. So it's like okay, the best thing you can do is get find a club, a volunteer opportunity, a job, a whatever the hell it is. Go join a sport. You don't have to be good at a sport. As long as you can just play, because if you go to a sport, everybody is there for the same thing, whether it's swimming, running, basketball, whatever, they're not going to really care if you're good, if you're trying and you're trying to learn and you're improving, because the longer you play, the better you get. And you will have that thing in common to talk about. And it's active, so you're actively doing something with people. Like Ryan said, bowling. Bowling. Find something in common and do the thing. That's that's literally whether you're in high school or adults or nearing your fifties. Like that's all you need to do. <laughs> and to help with that, try and pick the thing that you will enjoy doing on your own, right? Like if if you end up like that first couple times, not like instantly befriending someone, but you still enjoyed going to do the thing, then you're still like having a good time. Yep, exactly. All right, last question for the week. High school. Hello, I am a 14 male about to go to high school. Is there any insider tips I should consider to get good grades or do well in school? I feel like we could just parrot everything we said in the last question. No. (laughs) No, to get good grades or do well, I mean, honestly, you got to force it. It's not pleasant. It's not comfortable. But also... Like, you don't need that good of grades unless you're planning to go into something extremely specific. Like, like you could probably get away with a B or a C and you'll be fine. Good like grades is relative. I don't, yeah. B, well, B, B minus minimum. Yeah. Well, wait, you guys you guys don't think that, like, joining extracurriculars will help, like... Oh, no, that do grade? that, but... Yeah. Extracurriculars yeah, like, helps. Like, yeah. it, don't get me wrong. It helps. Research has shown to, like, being involved helps both with your enjoyment of school and your success because you're around other people who are contributing. Typically people who get involved in like school-based things also want to do well in school because they want to keep doing the thing. Yep. Um, Which then in turn results in positive role models. I actually have a friend of mine who he didn't really care much about his grades. Like he wasn't bad. He just was really middle of the pack, but he started hanging out with us. And, like, we met it, we really, like, got to know each other in high school, and, like, he started hanging out with us and eating lunch with us regularly, and became our friend, and he told us later, like, he realized, like, oh, shit, I need to get my grades up. Like, I gotta be on par with these guys. (laughs) So, because he hung out with us, he got better grades. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, choosing a good social group is important. There's also an other extreme, the hyper competitive academics who will literally undercut each other to make sure their rankings are higher. Avoid them. Oh I, my I, God. I, I, I interacted with them a bit. 
and then I've also interacted at the other end, the uh, dressed all in black, don't give a crap, uh, don't look in their locker because someone's going to jail, like crowd too. So yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, 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 love, I love how you describe those people. That's so specific. <laughs> you know exactly who I'm no, talking that's about. That. So specific, it's so accurate. <laughs> it's, See, in, in, in fact. In fact, those people are waiting for me at another channel to play video games after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Ryan makes a good point of, like, no, don't be afraid to get to know people, because, like, there were some people I hung out with who I had a lot of fun with who were not getting good grades. And, like, I didn't have to change who I was. I, there was one point where my family had a family reunion in my hometown, and my uncle was telling my dad, like, oh... RJ's doing stuff. He's just not telling you. He's he's probably smoking or drinking or he's doing something. <laughs> and my parents were like, no, he's not. Like, that's not the kind of person he is. Meanwhile, I'm in the parking lot of this park talking to two guys I know. And we're like 15, 16. And one of the guys is like, oh, hey, you want to smoke? And the one guy's like, oh, sure, why not? And I was like, nah, I'm good. Appreciate it, though. Like, I was proving my parents right, but also hanging out with the kids who were doing the shit. Yeah. <laughs> You're playing both yeah. sides. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't do much of the stuff either when I was a kid. I, I think I smoked pot once or twice at high school, but it, that was never, like, you know, always around those kids. If they're drinking, I'm like, I gotta drive. I'm not doing anything. And guess what? Most people, uh, almost exclusively, will the whole peer pressure thing from D.A.R.E. never really exists. You got a few people who are habitual, habitual assholes who do it just because. But yeah. it's... Those are rare, far and few between, and they actually end up getting run out. If they're not the center of the group, they're kind of on so far on the periphery of the group that everyone's like, just fucking ignore him. Like, just... <laughs> now, at the other he, end of the spectrum... He's around because he's around he gets the beer. Like, that's the only reason he's here. <laughs> the other end of the spectrum, those hyper-smart kids, you don't want to spend too much time with them either because they can be just as big of assholes. Oh, yeah. Um, I will never forget that in high school I was in advanced math and there was this one girl in my class who she skipped this she skipped a grade so she was like a year younger but she was in this advanced math class and we were doing whatever the thing was and I was like oh like this is the problem on this practice question like this is the answer to this practice question and she's like no you're wrong it's this I was like no you gotta do it like this this is what it is and she's like no you're wrong I'm smart like I'm smarter than you I, I know what it is and I was like Okay, you're wrong, but sure, good for you. And, like, the next class period, she's going off on me about, like, I skipped second grade, I'm so goddamn smart, like, I, I know yep. I know what I'm doing. We get to the next day, we get to that problem, the teacher reads out the answer, and I straight up went, loud as fuck in the middle of this class, I told you so. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the pettiness. <laughs> I, I got the, petty, because the, she was being a bitch. There's, there's a social group that bases itself on not caring and there's another social group that bases itself on not caring too much and they form their entire identities around that <laughs> and it's that is just something that is, that's extremely high school and early college i will not say it ends at high school i see it in the office i've seen it at a grocery store like people carry that because that's what they become programmed to do um but the biggest advice i can give is if you have the chance to do something early get it done early but yeah the paper might be due a month from now just do it now because yep. worst case, you stumble and find out, oops, I need to do more. It's better to do that now than panic the last second. And a lot of people like to joke about like, oh, I don't do anything until it's last, last second. Don't fall into those habits is the best I can give. And don't overstress about everything. Because like we said, if you're pulling a B average, you're fine. Like unless you want to go to an Ivy League and you want to get, and specifically to be one of the high end careers, Pulling a B average and going to community school or even a state school is not the end of the world. You're going to be fine because you're just as screwed as everyone else. You're, you're not going to get a job. What are you kidding? <laughs> Learn to invest now, kid, but don't invest all your money because you overinvest, you're screwed too. Like just, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, at some point throughout high school, I kind of stopped caring about grades. I just, I just, I wanted to work hard because I liked learning. I think that's a good, uh, that might be my uh, yeah. big advice for the person, the high schooler is just like, don't worry so much about the grades. Worry about working hard. Because the good grades will follow. If I know, I know there are people, and I'm sure you guys knew people like that who played the system and were just really good at taking tests and getting the grades and stuff. And then just everything just went out one year and out the other. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I, that, it was just like they're just. What's the point then? So I, I, I think it's more important to the the grades will come if you work hard and actually apply yourself. Um, 
don't make the grades the end all be all. That yep. just that just sounds like a miserable time. Yeah, it really if you can find a way to apply whatever you're learning in any shape or form to something you know, something you like to do, or yourself, that helps a lot too. Uh, a lot of people they struggle because there are what five different kinds of learning, and our school system focuses on just rote memory and listening. Like that's it. <laughs> um, so you know, if you can find a way to apply it either through imaginary scenarios or literal scenarios or what you just do around in a hobby, do it. Like that really does help. Uh, my practical advice, get okay with reading. You don't have to be good at reading. You don't have to be fast at reading, but be okay with the fact that you need to read. Like it doesn't matter if it's fucking science, math, social studies, English, whatever the fuck it is. You have to be able to read and read the texts. Yeah. If you can learn how to skim them to get the information you want. Cool. But that takes skill and practice to find what you need. And even then, you may not have the full comprehension you need to do the thing. So just get okay with reading. Um, drink water. Do the homework. It's it's boring. It sucks. But like Ryan said, if you can find a way to apply it, awesome. But just like Eli said, buckle down, do the thing. Um... It, and, it might be more fun to play video games right now instead of read the whole passage, but you know what's not fun? Having to work a job in your 20s that doesn't have ho paid holidays, so you don't get to play the video games anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then with application, like, even th the barest level of application you have on anything you learn in high school is cultural relevance, right? Like, fucking, I think it was like one or two weeks ago, I brought up the goddamn theory of the spheres and how, like, there's the musical music of the spheres that connects all of reality, which is, like, an offhand philosopher situation I learned about in goddamn European history class. Like, it's come up twice in my life, but both times I've been like, oh, hey, this is, reminds me of the thing. <laughs> or, like, the Bible. I was raised Catholic. I'm not practicing. But I, the knowledge of the Bible and Bible stories and, like, people from the Bible has come up so much in my life that I'm appreciative that I got that education on it. And high school's the same way of, no, you're probably not going to use geometry every single day of your life. I can like the area of a sphere every day, just like pumping it. I ain't talking about <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it right now. <laughs> well, fuck me, I guess. I need to get a different life. <laughs> um, but like knowing what to expect when you're looking at a triangle or looking at the area of a room or why calculus exists I don't like calculus I don't do calculus fucking ever but I know why we have it and if you hate math or our careers I don't use it it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, Get through I, my I built my I bit my, built my entire 20s and early 30s around avoiding math so it can be done <laughs> <laughs> Like, that was like one of the first things I dropped when I hit college was, like, originally I was getting a minor in accounting, and I took, like, a math class, and I was bored to tears because I oh. had done ad more advanced math already, to the extent that, like, I'm doing the homework in class, and the teacher came over and was like, no, no, we're on this for the pro- like, we're doing this problem right now for the practice, and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm doing the homework. Math? I can do, you know, basic math. I can do lab math. I can do geometry. I can do a bit of physics the, where the uh, the formulas are there. The minute we start getting into two in the weeds algebra where there's more uh, variables outnumbering numbers, I start to think we just don't have enough information. Why are we doing this? Like we're going to get an answer with numbers. But it isn't an answer. <laughs> like, Or the minute they get to imaginary numbers. Oh, God. I, I've argued with teachers about how absolutely asinine the idea of imaginary numbers <laughs> <laughs> but imagination yeah the minute the minute it loses tactile reference i cannot do math so you know you're gonna be good at good some things you're gonna be good at bad at others bad at others just you know find, find your niche work on that <laughs> the same thing reading, applies reading, writing and speaking so. all the same shit also applies to your first year of college first yeah. year of college you're probably going to take a bunch of courses that aren't necessarily related to your major it's because we want to have a well-rounded, well-developed populace. We want to ensure you've at least been introduced to ideas that maybe you didn't get introduced to before that first year of college. Because something might spark your interest and you'll say, Hey, wait, this is a thing? I want to know more about that. 
you're not going to use it every day, but we want you to have at least been introduced to it, so get over it. And if worse comes worse, there's always massive tax fraud, so I mean... When in doubt, <laughs> tax fraud. <laughs> All right, thank you both for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me on again. <laughs> Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off Yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. We're also on social media. Our Facebook is Better Buddies. Our former Twitter account is at Better, Bud- at Better Budcast. Use the hashtag Better Buddies when you tweet about the show. Our Gmail is BetterBuddiesCast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love, and or war, icebreakers you want us to answer, or questions you need advice on. And our YouTube channel, it's Better Buddies. It's got the purple logo. You can't miss it. We post clips of the show, so if there's anything you want to see, let us know. And last but not least, be a better buddy. A backup recording on my end? Oh, we should be good. I okay. forgot to hit record <laughs> for the second time ever in five years. We had a whole, we did a whole banger of an episode and it's gone, just lost in the ether. Which honestly oh, okay. is probably for the best.